All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, full crowd here, st standing room in the back. Uh, so hopefully we won't put anybody to, uh, to sleep. There is coffee right outside. My name is Greg Nierman. I'm a technology evangelist for Hitachi Data Systems. Uh, I also co-host a podcast called Speaking in Tech, which is distributed on the register every Wednesday. Uh, this panel is being recorded. Uh, it'll be available on YouTube. And we're going to also have it available on the podcast this Wednesday as well. And I also want to introduce Ken. Ken, why don't you introduce yourself? Ken's co-moderating with me. Sure. My name is Ken of Hoy. I am a technology evangelist at Rackspace, focused on educating users on OpenStack and helping the community. So um, one of the things I want to encourage you all to do, if you're, if you're on Twitter, to go ahead and tweet things you're hearing in the session using the uh, OpenStack hashtag. Please do. And we'll start off with Brian. If each of our panels could introduce themselves, so everybody has a context for, uh, for context for uh, your backgrounds and uh, some of the discussion we're going to be having, Brian. Sure, thanks. Uh, my name is Brian Gracely. I'm director of cloud solutions at EMC, and I also run the uh, Cloudcast podcast. My name is Manju Ramanathpura. I work for Hitachi Data Systems. I'm a CTO for Intelligent Platforms. Primarily, I fo focus on uh, cloud platforms. OpenStack being one of the primary initiatives that I'm driving in, uh, in Hitachi. And my name is John Griffith. I work at SolidFire. I'm a software engineer. Um, my focus is actually OpenStack. I'm the PTO for the Cinder project right now. Neil Levine of, um, was VP of products for Ink Tank, the sponsor of Ceph. Uh, I now work for Red Hat. And I'm not going to announce anything here. I'm, I'm Val Berkovici. I'm the evil twin of the guy with hair up on the screen there. Been at NetApp a, a long, long time, more than a decade and a half now. Uh, I direct uh, research for the company, and prior to that, I uh, was a reform developer. That's outstanding. You know, I want to start off this panel discussion. Neil, obviously, Ink Tank made some news. Uh, just within Something the happened? Yes, a, a little acquisition happened. Um, so I, I didn't even know which uh, company to, uh, or title to you put you to under. You need to speak to my lawyer. I can't comment <laughs> I on can't that. talk about it. But uh, give, give us some context for Red Hat's acquisition of Ink Tank. And I don't want to make this ab about vendors necessarily, but this is, this is, uh, there is a significant impact here for Ceph and the technology that surrounds that. Can you give us some background uh, specifically around Ceph? And then largely, I want to uh, open this up to the rest of the panel about the state of storage technologies and OpenStack in general. But just to kick us off, just let's talk about Ceph and Red Hat for a minute. Um, so for those who don't know, Red Hat, um uh, announced our acquisition of Ink Tank the week before last. Um, so Ceph is a um, massively scalable open source distributed storage product which has seen a lot of traction in the OpenStack uh, community, um, especially on the block side but also on the object side. And I think the acquisition, um, I, you have to ask Red Hat exactly for all their reasons of course, but um, certainly uh, Ceph's popularity within OpenStack was a huge part of that. But I think also they recognized that to become a serious um, software defined storage uh, player or to make a sort of dent in the storage community uh, they needed to bolster their <coughs> their, um, their portfolio bring in some of the strengths that Ceph has which complement cluster the existing storage technology that they have so um, OpenStack was was definitely a part but um, with the very early discussions we've had already it was it was about more than just OpenStack there were certainly there's the big data part that Ceph um, is looking to pay um, to get involved in as well so OpenStack plus more Outstanding. John, uh, why don't you kind of, uh, you've got a lot more exposure, I think, than a lot of us here on the panel about the state of storage and OpenStack right now. It'd be great to get your feedback and, and kind of a summary of where you think things are right now. Sure. Um, so I've, I've been working on the Cinder project for a couple of years now. Well, actually, from when it started on. Um, I, I think it continues to grow, uh, continues to mature. Um, I, th I think it gets better every release. Um, and one of the things that drives that is the fact that there are more and more vendors and more and more choices being introduced. Um, but the important thing is, is not only are we introducing more choices and more vendors, at the same time, we're also enforcing compatibility between those vendors and those choices. Um, and I think that makes a really huge difference. Um, so, you know, in my opinion, of course, I'm biased, but I think the state of storage in, in OpenStack, at least block storage in particular, is fantastic. Very good. You know, Val, it's, it's kind of funny. We've, we've got kind of three big, uh, traditional vendors, I guess, is a good way to, to describe it. Uh, what's the wh when folks think about storage in the OpenStack environment? A lot of times, it, every, the thoughts go right down to commodity hardware, uh, with the features being built into the software. Uh, from you know, from your perspective, and, and 
your view of where OpenStack is, is progressing. What is, is that true? Is, that, is this really, are we boiling this down to commodity storage? I think um, some of the people, I can't generalize anymore with 4,500 people here. I used to be able to generalize a couple of years ago and these sessions are smaller. Uh, but today, there's no easy answer to that anymore. I think if I were to sort of tread on that overused and abused software-defined storage term. If nothing else, I think OpenStack is the embodiment of software-defined storage. To administrators, it might mean options of white box as well as traditional storage vendors. But I think to developers, uh, there's no better community, no stronger community in the world of, of actual practitioners that implement storage through software as well as developers that consume it through software. Even Amazon, which is obviously the 800-pound gorilla in this space, Never heard you know, of it. it's, it's a closed system. You don't implement it, you just consume it. Here you get the choice and, and the luxury of actually interacting with people that implement. And so that, that to me is the true definition of software-defined storage and you know, not to just you know, brown nose here, but I think this community really is leading the way to, software, you know, to, the, to the, the promise and the value of software-defined storage. Yeah. So okay. let, me, let, me, uh, let me bring this up. So if we're talking about software-defined storage in OpenStack. Red Hat bought uh, Ink Tank, um, which is a unified storage platform and does software defined storage. So, is that, in your, in everyone's viewpoint, is that where we're going with um, with software defined storage? That it's that there's no longer value in the hardware. It's going to be purely in software only. So, who heard uh, Chris from Disney this morning? What were the three top words he emphasized? Fast, fast, fast. So, you got to look for where the value is. And the value for fast, in my mind, is at least twofold. The predictable one of when I'm in production, I want the application to be as fast as possible. Hardware acceleration, heavy metal helps there. But really, it's that 80, 90% of the, the application lifecycle during development and test, where you can be truly agile and create, you know, as some of our probably other um, members of the panel here, you've got solutions that can create hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of instances, Nova instances, Cinder instances. I'll put a plug in for Manila later in terms of why you need that. But all those instances very, very rapidly. Create them, delete them, make them you know, uh, permanent even though they start off as ephemeral. Those are things that we add value to. And, and, you know, so it's really hard, to, again, to generalize and say only Ceph or only Swift or only Gluster or whatever. Is, is the way of the future because you've got to have that option of being able to go fast when you need to go fast and deliver value with a range of options, including software only, including hardware only, and, and the right balance in between. So, what, can you, uh, and again, it doesn't have to be you, Val, but other folks on the panel. I mean, what do you mean, when you say value, what do you mean by value? Again, in a, in a world where, you know, AWS, a lot of even uh, OpenStack clouds, it's the, the, the storage is dumb and cheap. Right? We don't really care what's running on them as long as they present uh, capacity. Well, I think, um, um, so again, I would go back to the keynote uh, presentation. You know, Glenn Ferguson from Wells Fargo talked about uh, some of the challenges that banks have right, uh, in terms of compliance, meeting the compliance, making the uh, backup, and uh, having a certain type, you know, expectations built in, in terms of the rules and regulations that you follow, right? Um, those challenges, we still need to evolve as an OpenStack community, now I'm speaking. I think there is room for OpenStack as a whole to improve, and when you look from a software-defined uh, point of view, I think, uh, um, that's where the gaps are, you know. Uh, you, you look from a software defined, it's really about uh, using your software to programmatically manage your infrastructure. It's less about using the commodity hardware or, you know, using non-commodity hardware, right? That's really the abstraction, software defined. And uh, OpenStack has really um, driven the wave of using the commodity hardware, especially in the space of shared nothing storage space. But when you go into the shared storage space, there is still a lot of work that we can, you know, we all have to do as a community. And, um, and uh, that's where I think some of the, um, uh, you know, the, when you talk about value added uh, functionalities from storage vendors, I think there is more value over there. Um, and that helps for customers like Wells Fargo that we're talking about meeting certain compliance requirements, right? Um, sorry, go ahead. Uh, so one thing I wanted to add, you know, on the on the topic of 
it's just dumb storage, right? And you don't care. It's right. just block. Who cares? Um, I don't. I don't think that's true. I don't think that's true at all. I think there are um, a lot of differences, whether it be via the software, like some some products are, or whether it's via hardware or whatever. Um, there are significant differences, and depending on your environment and your use cases, they matter. Um, it may be performance. It may be things like battling the noisy neighbor problem, uh, quality of service, you know, things like that. Or maybe it's just more along the lines of availability, um, you know, HA, redundancy, things like that. Um, those things are really, really important. Um, the thing is, is everybody offers a different sweet spot. You know, everybody on the stage, I think each of us would take our product and, and be able to put one thing up and say, this is one thing we do extremely well compared to everybody else. And I think depending on your use case and your environment, that's going to dictate which one of those you're going to want to look at. Or maybe you want to look at all of them. And that's um, I, please don't ask us to define what software-defined storage is, because I think you'll <laughs> with five we can, people, we can ask Brian even right from here. me, you'll get, <laughs> you'll, 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 get, you'll get three opinions just from me. Um, but I think the, you know, I don't want to make a forecast about the future and is it just dumb storage, is it just commodity? I think the, the, the great thing about OpenStack is it's allowing the businesses to discover what it is to them. Actually, I th you know, that yes, there is, there's obviously legacy stuff there, but now they've got a chance to explore and say, well, actually, do I want to try commodity-based um, uh, hardware for, for my storage? Or, you know, do I want to have a mix and match approach? And it's one of the great strengths of Cinder, of course, is it allows you to do that in a relatively seamless way from the control plane. Um, and I think customers are trying to, w they're discovering that now. What is, what, what is the value they get from the different solutions? Um, and as John says, you know, some of them really value the QoS or the HA. Of course, some of them really, really value low, lower cost storage. Um, so if, if, you know, wh where the cost is the primary consideration, obviously that's where the commodity comes in. But yeah, of course, the, I think there'll be, you know, heterogeneous environments for a while. But um, OpenStack is, it's surfacing the value very, very obviously to the different um, users of OpenStack. Of, you know, OpenStack Ken, now. I, I saw we, we've got a question in the audience. Come, come on up. I'd love to, if anybody else has got some questions, uh, just line up behind the microphone. Go ahead. On. Okay. Not yet. <laughs> Just talk really loud. We'll, we'll re-articulate the question. Uh, I'm Greg Tinker. I work in HP Engineering. My question on you know, everybody's talking about commodity-based storage, uh, community, community. As OpenStack continues to grow into the enterprise, into the environment where criticality of business availability is critical and crucial, right? So we have these uh, Hitachi data systems, the OEM, ISP storage systems, three parts. The list goes on and on in the enterprise space. And I don't think it's going cool. No. Uh, so, <laughs> and uh, so anyway, my question comes to the fact that where are we at moving forward with the API so that the operating system can now manipulate? If you want to stand up a quick operating system, I want an API to actually go and provision my storage for me mm -hmm. so I don't have to have a storage administrator go and make a mistake or maybe they do it right and the, you know, the list goes on and on and on availability. But the API moving forward, mm -hmm. we used to have it years ago, mainframe, So, 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 let me just, so the, the question, is, uh, if I can summarize, is uh, where, when will we get to the point where, the, to do the, because of the APIs, you can actually do the management of the storage layer up at the open stack layer, as opposed to having to go to each individual storage solution and right. do configurations there? Right. I just want to make one point, and I'd like you to uh, pick it up. I think uh, instead of using commodity hardware, it's probably good for our conversation to use general purpose hardware. The difference is people associate commodity with cheap and you know no value in the hardware. The real discussion here is having a general purpose hardware so that you don't have like a vendor lock-in from a hardware point of view as well, but you still get the benefits of differentiated hardware. So if somebody wants uh, uh, you know some uh, acceleration that has to happen on hardware for faster data replication, faster snapshots. They should be able to do it. But, uh, you know, the, the differentiation there is use a general purpose hardware so that, you know, the customer could use Hitachi's API, NetApp's API, EMC's API, SolidFire, you know, anyone's API, and they should be able to pick and choose the underlying hardware platform. Uh, so. John? Yeah. Uh, yeah, sure, I'll let you go so there's a, a word I think a lot of us use here, which is a storage catalog. And uh, if you expose your interfaces, you know, for Cinder and others through a storage catalog, implemented inside that catalog should be your specific provisioning for the kind of 
you know, service level you expect, the kind of pricing, the kind of replication, backup, and so forth that you need. So that's sort of my, my simple answer to that, is if you implement most of the storage implementation and orchestration, provision and orchestration services behind the catalog, we can, we can satisfy what you ask for. Yeah. I, um, I, I mean, I think the other thing to, to sort of keep in mind with this, and we've, um, we, we've seen this over the last three, four, five years as, as we see more and more converged systems. We've seen, you know, what used to be siloed things, you've now got a virtualization team that has to know enough about networking and enough about storage. Um, some of that exists today already, and we're getting to the point where the storage team uh, you know, provisions whatever there is on the network side, they provision pools of storage, and like Val says, they'll expose that through either service catalogs or through an API. I, I think the thing that's a little bit of a stretch though, um, and, and you'll find it in little pockets of things, but it's, it's, it's quite a bit of a stretch to believe that you're going to have uh, application teams that are going to know enough about storage, and if you think about storage, not just I want a, a blob of whatever, I need a LUN of whatever size, but I need to know what that thing does because somewhere down the road in your application, you probably have to back it up. It may be important enough that you need to have a copy of it somewhere else and God forbid it becomes a compliant and, uh, and thing that you've got to govern. That's not stuff that any application team typically is thinking about other than they just go, I want it to run all the time. So the, the sort of, the premise that you're gonna build a system that storage is just an API and you don't have to think about anything else I think is, is a stretch. I think what you were talking about though, if you get to a point where that storage team or that data team gives you either pools of, of data, however you get to it, object, file, block, and that they're gonna, they're gonna worry about some of those things on the back end in terms of giving you what looks like an SLA, uh, I think from an application team, that's when you start going, okay, I, it tells me how much is available and, you, and, I can, and I can dynamically grow it or shrink it how I need to. Uh, I think that's a model that becomes much more tenable in terms of that, that split between whether it's dev and ops or apps and storage or network. Uh, John, I, I see you uh, <laughs> furling your brow over there. So I'm, I'm kind of confused um, because basically what you described in, in, in a good part of what people have talked about here is actually what Cinder does, right? So, so when you talk about provisioning storage, um, I guess maybe I'm confused on which piece of the provisioning you talk about. If you're talking about installing and configuring the storage device, that's one thing. Um, and, and I don't see that going into a common API. But if you're talking about actually provisioning off pieces for users, that's exactly the point. I mean, that's, that's OpenStack, that's Cinder, right? It's self-service and... In, in okay, perfect. Yeah. I want to provision out RAID 5, RAID 1, I want to be mirrored, I want to be backed up. You have a pool of each one of those business requirements, dev, sure. production, yep. so that the end user can say, I want to build a test machine, and they would go and pick your certain qualifications, yep. pull that storage out of a given pool, and so it's easier for them. And that's exactly what we have. Yeah. So, so in Cinder, what we have is we provide an API. The end user doesn't know necessarily what is on the back end and what's serving it up, and they may have choices. So depending on the OpenStack admin and what they set up, they may have choices like, I want something that's HA, I want th something that's backed up, I want something that has this performance level, whatever it might be, and we use a filter scheduler to do the automatic placement based on those parameters that they provided. So I think we're closer to, to what you think than, than maybe the impression that you so got. I guess the question, I think the question comes up is, um, maybe you're mixing OpenStack now with software-defined storage, but I think, one of the, I think the question is, how much, how much of the value of each of your individual solutions should you surface up to OpenStack? Because remember, with, right, the reference implementation for Cinder, for example, was on commodity storage that had no QoS, none of those types sure. of function. But now we're talking about each of you having unique functionality. Should we be exposing that up to OpenStack? So, so here's the thing. And, and so first of all, the, the software-defined storage thing, th this was a really hot topic over the past year, right? And I, I was on a panel in, in Hong Kong on this and, and got beat up really, really bad. Um, <laughs> but the way I look at it is, OpenStack and Cinder, in, in my view, everybody has a different view, right? So maybe I'm completely wrong, but the way I view it is Cinder is the software-defined storage. That's the whole point, right? So that's, that's kind of the premise I'm going on. So if it doesn't match up, maybe that's why. Um, in terms of the features, absolutely. The, the whole point is there's no reason to have a lowest common denominator and a race to the bottom in terms of the storage uh, and, and in terms of OpenStack and Cinder. But um, at the same time, 
that has to be done in such a way that it doesn't impact compatibility or usability for anybody else. So the way we do that in Cinder right now that I think works really well is we allow you to custom define volume types. And those volume types may point to different things or expose specific functionality and features that different products have. So SolidFire, for example, we expose quality of service through that. And actually now multiple vendors do that. So, um, but, but that's just one example. And then OpenStack also provides extensions. So you can always add uh, extra capability and extensions and stuff and customize your deployment that way without impacting base compatibility. So, Neil, you, know, you had some comments? Um, yeah, I mean, I, well, this follows on directly from what John was saying, which I think the, um, the challenge is going to be how we've, I think we've got the commonality done. There's some tech vectors still to go and fix, but ultimately the common API is there. And as John said, we can, we can well extend to expose our individual capabilities. It's how do we move on to innovate collectively beyond that. That's, I think, the next challenge. And that's going to be a very unusual thing for people in the storage industry um, to, to try and say, well, actually, we think we can push the state of the art of, of storage com you know, through a common API. It's not an extension. And you know, we'll, we'll work on that and develop that individually so we can expose it at different costs or performance points, what have you. I think that that's the, you know, in terms of the API flexibility that um, I think the question I wanted, I think that's, that's the next the next challenge for us here. And yeah, just to sort of double down on what Neil said, I think exposing the commensurate cost of a particular new feature is really, really critical because it's, it's, you can still sort of dumb down to a naive enterprise setting where, you know, the budget was allocated last year or two years ago and I can consume this resource at any rate I want. It, to be really cloud, you have to make sure that the cost is visible. It's an upfront part of the interface. And it shouldn't always be super intuitive where the most valuable, fastest, coolest feature is the most expensive. But as you start to consume it, particularly at scale, you need to know what the commensurate cost is for the service level you're requesting. You know, I, I'd like to uh, ask each of the panelists uh, just real quick as, as we're getting uh, toward the end of, of this discussion. What are some of the challenges you see around the corner for OpenStack and storage specifically uh, that uh, folks that are ex exploring this should be conscious of and some of the things you're conscious of? And I'll, I'll, John, I'll start off with you, start off with you again because, again, I know you're up to your eyeballs in this, and, and I'd love to get your, get your reflections of those challenges, and then we'll, go, we'll move around the panel. Sure. Um, you know, so I, I, I think... Um, there's, there's a lot of different perspectives on this, so I'll, I'll give it as, as PTO working on the project and what I see on a daily basis. Um, one of the biggest challenges I see is actually how do you continue to have some sort of compatibility and some sort of structure and things like that when OpenStack is now the hot newness, right? Every group, every engineering group, everybody that has a storage product, they have marketing people and salespeople saying, hey, you have to have an OpenStack driver right now. Right? You have to be in there. Um, the problem is continuing to scale that and make sure that you're still delivering a quality product. Um, and, I, and I think we're, we're taking the right steps to do that, and I think it's, it's going to continue to even get better. Um, but I think that's one of the biggest challenges. Um, the new features thing uh, that just came up, that's a tough one too. Um, and, and part of the problem there is, how do you define where those features should be? Uh, you know, one of the big debates that we have is, is on replication. Is replication something that is an end user feature or is it an admin feature? Um, does it belong in the, API, uh, in the API at all, right? So there's all sorts of things like that. So those, those are some of the big challenges I see. Manju, do you want some reflections on the challenges you see? Yeah, I would uh, probably dwell a little bit more on the feature side. I'm looking more from a customer's perspective and what, uh, how they are using it today and how they want to use it in the future, right? I think uh, some of the topics that we've been discussing here from an enterprise point of view keeps coming up. You know, how, how do I do a, a replication? How do I do a disaster recovery? Um, and how do I do a, a, a fast snapshot, fast cloning, uh, when you're deploying hundreds of hundreds of virtual machines? Um, the, uh, and uh, backup restore. Uh, those type of things uh, keep coming up in the enterprise world where they're used to using certain uh, other tools that fits in with the rest of the data center. And you know it could be from a compliance point of view, for instance, right? right? So if I configure my data center to meet certain high availability, and my that metrics is automatically propagated into some other tool that our compliance police are using, right? How does uh, automatically all these pieces 
plug together in an open stack environment is a challenge that uh, I see. It, no, not necessarily, again, going back to John's point, it's not necessarily a Cinder's problem now. It's really more of a data center management problem. You know, some of the things are more of a features that are specific to storage. Some of the things are more about how the data center as an entity is managed and how Cinder, you know, gives the outbound messaging to those tools. You know, I think that's another challenge we need to look into. Right. Neil, you want to take, take a pass at it? Actually, I was going to echo similar things here. I mean, again, this is personal from the, the Ceph perspective. Um, I mean, I think there is there's some more challenges just to surface the kind of enterprise features that the customers want. And I'm not too worried about that. I think the problem is relatively well defined and we've just got to write the code and, you know, mul handling multi-site and disaster recovery a bit more elegantly and these kind of things. Um, I do think there is still some tech debt which needs to be caught up on, which, um, you know, is natural in a project like this. But I think the, uh, I think to speak to, to Manju's comment, that the, the real challenge I think is going to be the, the interaction between things like Cinder and Neutron in the sense of actually the network becomes really important and if it's all software defined, you know, if there's an asymmetric network failure, how do you pick that up? How do you correct for that? How do you how do you modify both? Does the storage react to the network, or does the network react to the storage challenges? And I think um, you know there's a coordination issue there between Cinder and other projects to um, to handle that in a common way, which makes it easy for the the administrator or the data center manager to, to handle. And I think you know the um, it's a it's a it's a challenge across all of OpenStack to ensure that these things are well sort of con the concept is well thought of before we start implementing things, and that's going to be a challenge for you know people who are just Cinder devs, and that's all they are to start really collaborating. I think. All right. All right, we'll get to Val next. I just want to encourage any, anybody from the audience if you have a question, please just step up to the microphone, and we'll get to those questions in just a minute. Go ahead, Val. So again, I'll, I'll just start by agreeing with Neil with regards to integration of Cinder and Swift, and hopefully Manila as well into the greater OpenStack ecosystem. Whether it's Neutron, Heat, Glance, deeper integration is really important. But I see two really, really big challenges, which in my mind are also major opportunities. The near-term one is the fact that two-thirds of enterprise storage today is unstructured through file interfaces. So I think it's a huge opportunity to actually leapfrog Amazon and be able to have you know, something like a Project Manila be promoted to a first-class project, you know, not just a blueprint right now, and be able to satisfy all those file interface requests and requirements, POSIX requirements in the enterprise, and not the least of which is implementing some pretty cool shared storage instances between multiple Nova instances, actually. Uh, that's a huge near-term opportunity. Uh, the long-term one is really what I spend most of my time in research, which is super cool. Uh, the, the next evolution of fast storage isn't faster storage. It's slower memory. It's persistent memory. So the ability for the OpenStack community to define persistent memory interfaces, mm. perhaps building off some of the work that I know Alex is involved in in um, the, the SNEA community with NVMe and NVMe programming extensions that Intel, NetApp, and others are working on. The ability to define how you now offer up persistent memory for Nova instances, perhaps a new kind of instance type for sender and so forth, that is a really, really cool opportunity. That's something that Amazon inevitably will bury behind some pretty cool instance as well but the opportunity for the OpenStack community to be more agile, to get their first add value there is, is, uh, is upon us. I think in the next couple of design sub summits and conferences, that'll be a big topic of discussion because the um, economies of scale are, are going there. Outstanding. Brian, any thoughts on some of the challenges? Um, yeah, I, mean, I, I think the thing that we hear from our customers the most is, you know, the, the, the applications they're rolling out don't tend to be uh, incredibly siloed anymore. They tend to be there's an element of it that's that's going to be uh, HDFS and an and object, and they want to do analytics on that. At the same time, they're doing relational database dips, and so there's a block element to it, and uh, there may very well be a file. And, and what they're trying to do is go, uh, you know, I don't want to have to think about five, six different APIs and plug, like, how do I get to a point where I'm really just thinking about this as a set of workflows, whether it's for provisioning or it's for backup? And they're, like, in us in particular, they're pushing us very, very hard to go, I want you guys, as, as sort of storage experts and people that have products across these things, how are you going to make that simpler for me? I understand kind of these core technology elements of it, whether it's Cinder or Swift or Manila or whatever's coming down the road. That's all great. That's, that's parts of the engine. How do you make that simpler for me? Because I don't want to have to burden my application guys going, 
it's this hard to build an application that has multiple pieces and now the underlying infrastructure is, is all these different components. So that's what we see quite a bit is people going, the applications are getting more interesting and more complex. Please don't keep making your infrastructure so incredibly complicated. Simplify the number of APIs I'm talking to, simplify the points of management and so forth. Right. Uh, we got, we got quite a character here ready to ask a question. Alex, go ahead. What's your question? So the question is about standards. You know, it, 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 go ahead, John. Well, <laughs> so, well, the, the only thing is, it, so I do, I do want to touch on the vendor lock-in thing, and you, and you said that vendors are usually kicked out and stuff. I, I would argue the complete opposite, especially if you look at the stats on any project in OpenStack right now, but especially Cinder, um, and you look at where the contributions come from and what's going in, um, it is vendor driven. Um, and, and vendors are valuable and important. Uh, there's no question about that. I suspect vendor lock-in is a big vendor Yeah, I, I think the vendor lock-in argument is, is kind of hype, to be honest. Uh, because if OpenStack is doing its job and doing what it's supposed to do and giving you that compatibility of what those pools are on the back end, Vendor lock-in shouldn't exist. It shouldn't matter. So, the next point, standards. so, so standard. So, so when you say that, right? So standards. Are you talking like uh, SMIS, or are you talking, or are you talking just keeping standards and keeping things from breaking? I'm talking standards or lowercase s. Okay. Not, not big standards, totally. Totally agree. Totally agree with you, 100. percent And and that's something that, uh, again, on the Cinder side, we have definitely tried to focus on because we've seen what's happened in some of the other projects when people do upgrades, and it is bad. It is really ugly. I think everybody has come away pretty bloody from that, and they've learned, and I think everybody, every project in OpenStack now is really um, fully aware and, and focused on trying to make that better. I don't know how we standardize that and make it you know, something as part of a process. I mean, right now we have Grenade, um, which runs and actually takes all of your code and ports it back and make sure it runs on the previous version of OpenStack as well as the current version, right? Um, all of those things are, are good and it's a good start. We definitely have a long way to go though. I think, I think we have to make that better. Sorry. Uh, I'll just make a quick comment. I think uh, where we are from an OpenStack point of view, it's, uh, it's really more following the model of fast, fast, fast. We really want to get uh, OpenStack ready, deployed, managed. Um, it's in sort of like a startup phase still, I think. And uh, but some of the components like Cinder Nova um, are maturing at a faster rate than some other. Um, and I think it's more of a cycle. Or, you know, once you have customers deployed Cinder, once you have customers deployed Nova, you will start seeing the resistance to not make major changes to the API structure. I think that will sort of evolve into its own standard. This is just my perception, as opposed to following, say, SNEA standard or CDMI or something like that. Um, and that my take on the why that's happening is probably more because uh, of the you know the developer mentality to let's get it done. I don't want to get bogged down into the bureaucracy of standards. Um, um, I, I'll actually pause on the second one. I, I, I think to a, I mean I think to a certain extent. So yeah, th there's some there's some general sort of don't do evil types of things, but the the marketplace knows how to deal with vendor lock-in. They know how to deal with risk management. Storage is one of those few industries that you don't have. Uh, truly, truly an 800 pound gorilla. I mean, that you know, 30% is sort of market leadership. It's not networking, it's not database. Um, so 
the, the market knows how to deal with this stuff. Customers have choice in which distro they want to use. They have choice in which platform they want to use today. Um, if they want to go Wild West and go, look, I'm just going to kind of pick and choose whatever I want. Find me a customer who goes, I really don't care which vendor I do, and I just plug them all freely in for Ethernet switching or storage. That's kind of a problem that's solved. I think the vendors tend to focus on it because we have to sort of defend it a little bit to our customers who go, well, I'm going to, I'm going to beat you up for, for vendor lock-in. Vendor lock-in is a risk management. That's what it is. Um, and whether you look at it as cost management or technology management, the market knows how to deal with this stuff. We, we as vendors worry about it because we have to fill out RFPs and stuff, but I don't see it as a, as a massive, massive problem because, again, you don't have, at least in storage, you don't have that one gorilla that owns 60, 50, 60, 70, 80 percent of the market that can make one change and everybody else is locked out, right? I mean, there's how many? 20-something storage vendors that are contributing code. Yeah. I think maybe you use the word standards and you've thrown everybody because we thought it was capital S, CDMI, SNEA kind of things here. I think quality and sort of not breaking things is probably, quality is actually the phrase you, you meant, maybe. Not, yeah. you know, don't, don't change the API so suddenly everything breaks. I mean, I think, don't break, don't break I mean, this is, a, this is a standard thing in open source communities. It's like the developers want to rush forward to developing cool new stuff and the product guys are going, wait, 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 you're breaking things. Um, I mean, this is an, this, it's an emergent thing which will happen in a community. It's happened in other open source projects and I think uh, there'll be a natural shift, uh, probably in the downstream OpenStack products where they take a lot of the driver code and everything else. And I mean, th they'll maintain the quality because they're the ones who are on the line for, you know, when, you know, mind you, new masters of Red Hat or Canonical or Cloud Scaling, whoever it is, when they're shipping a product, they're going to be the ones on the line when the customer does the upgrade and everything breaks. And I think they'll police things to a certain extent. But I think Cinder is actually one of the better projects anyway. I think it's kind of, it's, it's, it's fairly mature from an API point of view. So that, that clean abstraction, I think it's fairly consistent now. It doesn't vary a huge amount, especially because of these different extensions, which give to the vendors that opportunity to play with things. But you know, if when the customers really demand, do not break anything at all. I want 100% verification. They'll put, you know, that'll force force the change. And I think that's happening right now. So it's not a concern we've seen from our customers, certainly within the storage domain. Okay. So okay, let me let me ask one last question. Hang on, I, I got to jump in here. <laughs> so I'll be brief. Yeah. Uh, so the the adage about cloud is. You know, the, the cost of failure is really, really low, which is why people like to move fast and break things because the failure, cost of failure is low, but the price of success is high. So there's a major milestone I can't let pass with that question that happened two weeks ago. Who knows what Facebook's motto used to be? Move fast and break things. As of two weeks ago, who knows what changed? <laughs> that motto at the F8 conference they just held, where they realized their developers now, their own infrastructure and all of the APIs they expose to the billions of dollars of revenue they do with their developers, the interface is so important now that keeping that stable, consistent, and so forth is the new mantra and the new reality. So I think it's a really fascinating milestone. It shows you that once you succeed, you grow up, and I expect that problem to go away with success. Okay. Um, so last question. This is related to storage vendors and open source, right? So I talk in the ecosystem, to be frank, there's a, lot, there's a huge suspicion about, op about storage vendors, that basically you guys are in it, ju basically just to sell products that you're not really interested in helping the community, OpenStack move any further. So, w so A, how do, you address, how, how do you address that accusation, and B, what do you do about it? And specifically, I'm talking about people who say all, all the storage vendors are doing is adding drivers. No one's actually doing anything to make OpenStack storage a better product. Ken, Ken, we're going to need to move very quickly yeah, here. Yeah, you have to move very quick. Look, look at the data. Look at the contributions that people make, not just lines of code, number of contributors to the OpenStack project, but look at open source in general, contributions to Linux, to BSD, to the new Heartbleed initiative in terms of securing, you know, funding the secure open source foundation for a lot of our, you know, app, app infrastructures. Look at the data. It's an ignorant comment if you look at the data. I have a slightly different view, maybe. Um, uh, I'll come back to my earlier point. We've... We've got a pretty good, very good API abstraction now. We need to innovate on it. So it's going to be step up and show. And uh, yeah, I mean, look, we had to do the drivers. Everyone had to do the drivers. Um, so as that's the table stakes to start playing with the API at that point. But I think you know, they are committing the resources. Yes, I think they have been focused on, on just making their stuff work. But I think it'll be especially interesting at this summit and the next one, what, what new features do they ex surface first in the Cinder API and that they put resources into, ex um, into that which then benefits everybody in the community. I mean, it's, the proof will be in the features and the code. 
Well, uh, unfortunately, we're getting the hook. I got from the back of the room. John, I'll let you go real quick, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. All right. So this is one of my favorite topics. So <laughs> <laughs> I I would say that that Ken absolutely there are definitely vendors in the community that are just doing a driver, and that's it. Um, there are other vendors that are doing significantly more. Um, again, you can look at the stats, you can look at Garrett, you can look at GitHub, and you can find out who those are. Um, you know, I'm the perfect example. I work for a vendor. Um, but we're not in it just to sell more product or just to get a driver. And obviously, I've been leading the project. Um, so you can look and get that information. Um, at the same time, though, I want to say that a vendor that wants to just put a driver in and, and be an OpenStack to try and get some sales, that's not a bad thing in my opinion. Um, because the bottom line is, I, I don't care. If, if anything is driving OpenStack and getting more customers and more potential users interested in OpenStack, and that's a roadway, that's a gateway for them to get into OpenStack, that's great. I, I'm fantastic with that. And I think we're going to have to wrap it up on that note. Thank you very much, Ken. Thanks, Val, Neil, John, Manju, of course, Brian. And thank you, Full House. Really appreciate you guys making it out for this. Thank you.